Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the second taping of 465. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Congo. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's December the 18th, 2018. Okay, gentlemen, welcome back to the program. Um, uh, let's play the tape real quick. To tape. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode three. And that's what happens when a microphone dies. It's not that I was speaking in adjunct uh, sentences and I, I just avoided every other syllable. The microphone died, and we're going to have a service for it later. Uh, what are what are adjunct sentences? Oh, I wasn't going to ask that. <laughs> well, I'm a grammar expert, if you don't know that already, by George, listening to 465 kind of... episodes of Unscripted. But you mean that they're underpaid sentences that don't <laughs> yes. have tenure and... Uh, uh -huh. uh, they, and... they don't deserve to be heard, but they work too hard. You know well, how George, it works. <laughs> in technical geek language, George, they're clearly sentences that destroy microphones. QED. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just do, do, do. So we have a new one now show the, the fans our, our, our new <laughs> microphone and hopefully this will work just fine so we're recording to, uh, today the tuesday you contributing you would be paying for that but since <laughs> yes <laughs> yes since donations since are not, down kevin took care of it <laughs> <laughs> mrs anglican tv bought us a microphone thank you jill wherever she may be all right well let's get on with the show um we had a fun show yesterday that you're not going to get to hear, so we're going to do one today that should be just as fun, uh, if not more so. Before we get started, audience participation, click the like button, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, share the episode with your friends, bishops, and, and congregations, comment as often and frequently as you desire, because uh, we read the comments and we, we reply to them. Subscribe if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to get an instant notification that uh, there's a new episode, you click subscribe and there's a little bell next to it. There's a picture right in front of your screen there. You click on that bell and it will send you an instant notification. Um, and we do offer a podcast. And for those people who have a certain device called Alexa, you can say, play the latest episode of Anglican Unscripted, and boom, it's there for you. Um, let's move on to the news. What I've discovered in, in the last half dozen years uh, in the Anglican Communion, um, the feminist won't let God choose his gender. That's not part of God's privilege anymore. And now the Church of England won't let God choose my gender. And if you haven't been paying attention, they now have a new uh transgendered baptism and i thought we could talk about that even though we mentioned it before in a previous episode it's still the news in the church of england as of today because a person in charge of it has kind of decided what he was working on wasn't that great after all gavin give us an update well kevin it begins with a confession because uh i wrote quite a caustic article about Bishop Julian Henderson, who was chair of the committee that produced the new, the new, effectively the new baptismal liturgy. Um, and uh, I slept on it overnight and I realized I thought I'd made a mistake because what had happened was at the beginning of the week, his committee produced it and then he commended it as being based on a sound use of scripture and being wholly orthodox theologically. And by the end of the week, a letter was produced by the Church of England Evangelical Council in, in, in muted outrage, saying that the scripture was, was lousy, the, the interpretation of the scripture was very poor, the theology was lousy, and this was not something that would glorify God or the church. And the chief signature of that letter was the same man who'd commended it at the beginning of the week, Bishop Julian Henderson. So at first sight, this looks like it's farce and ridiculous. But, but after sleeping on it and giving it a bit more thought, I began to have some real sympathy for Julian Henderson because I had a sense of what probably had happened. Um, it's a mistake to imagine that the way the Church of England is lumbering on is haphazard or uh, in any kind of way accidental. It's part of a, a well-orchestrated progressive plan that has been in the minds of the proponents of the plan for a very long time. And so last July, when General Synod decided that it would produce this liturgy under great pressure from the, the uh, gay activists, um, someone at some point would have said, how do we stifle 
the inevitable evangelical kickback there's going to be when we try and foist this on the faithful church. And somebody else will say, I know, let's put their most prominent bishop and make him in charge of the committee. And then if they attack the committee, they attack him and they, they shoot themselves in the foot and the head at the same time. So that's what they did. They put Julian Henderson in charge of the committee. Now, why he accepted it, we don't know. We, we do know that Justin Welby rules the House of Bishops with a pretty heavy hand and no conservatives step out of line ever. The liberals and the progressives step out of line all the time. Uh, and so we don't know what pressure was brought to bear on him. But we do know that after a week of criticism, he joined the criticism himself. And I think that probably means he was in an awful position. He repented of being in an awful position and he wanted to change sides. Quite what price he'll pay at the hands of his colleagues and Justin Welby when he attends the next bishop's meeting is another matter he should be prayed for. But I think we should give him, I think we should give him credit and we should ourselves be all the more alert to the sophistication and the ruthlessness actually with which this progressive agenda is being marched through the Church of England by Welby and Sentamu and like-minded colleagues. Well, it's a great honor to be asked by an archbishop to be on a committee. Uh, we've seen this in the Episcopal Church. We've seen this around the Anglican Communion. Um, hey, would you like to head up the Pilling Report? Would you like to be part of you know this uh, deciding committee to help us with the, the future doctrine of the Church? Even though we're not changing our canons or articles, um, could you help us in this? And uh, I've seen bishop after bishop say, yes, I will do it. It's a great honor. Um, and this is what happens because there's a it viral over there in the Church of England. I don't think you've, you know, uh, not noticed that. Um, George, this is, you know, a tide is changing now in the Church of England from what I've seen on social media. We've seen uh, both on our websites and I've noticed on Twitter, Facebook, because uh, I monitor these things for uh, our work with Anglican Inc. The response to the transgender right has been one of outrage. Uh, conservatives across the board have just been uh, thrown up their hands and we're seeing clergy in the Church of England uh, stating publicly, this is the tipping point for me. I need now to find a way out. I need to begin planning. Now, does that mean anything's going to happen tomorrow? No. But I think that a symbolic uh, point has been reached where uh, a critical mass of people has begun to say, it can't go, this is too much, it's gone too far. And by the same token, the left is outraged by this report. They're not satisfied, it doesn't go far enough, it doesn't, uh, doesn't do justice to the transgender. So the uh, traditionalists, the evangelicals, what have you, actually normal people find this whole thing, you know, there's no longer one faith, uh, one baptism. Uh, there are multiple faiths and as many baptisms as you feel like. Uh, no, as, you, as you have gender identities. I mean, uh, so that the uh, temperature, this is not something that will go away uh, without uh, causing some less. That's going to leave, this is going to leave a mark, as It'll they say. Mark. This is going to leave a bruise. But I, I want to uh, second Gavin's uh, point. Um, uh, there's a, an American. Uh, political commentator uh, who's also a cartoonist named Scott Adams. He does the Dilbert cartoons and he's he's very, very influential uh, uh, in conservative circles. And one of the things he talks about is the 48 hour rule. When somebody says something that's really dumb, hold back your criticism for at least 48 hours because that'll give them a chance to clarify and explain. Now, now Bishop, uh, Bishop Henderson's uh, point, that was 72 hours, but, you know, England, they're <laughs> slower over there. Slower, different time zone. <laughs> and so let, let, let's, think, let's think about it. My experience of the conservative movement within the Anglican world for the past 25, 30 years is that we are happier, we are most happy when we are shooting our wounded, when we are dispatching those people to the outer darkness who have not somehow met the finest, most intricate point of orthodoxy that we think is right. And so, of course, when this blew up, the initial reaction among many people, and my emotional reaction was, how could this man be so damn stupid? Now, that's not a Christian response. <laughs> Julian Henderson thought about what he did, and he actually did the manly thing, the Christian thing. 
He didn't go along to get along. He didn't seem to ob obfuscate. He basically said, I have made a mistake and I repudiate, uh, I repudiate the old boys network of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. I repudiate the pressure the Archbishop of Canterbury has been put on me to uh, come up with a stitch up that makes sure everybody's on board. Julian Henderson comes out of this in my book as almost as, as, as being a heroic figure. George, I agree with you. At the end of the day, Julian Henderson comes out the hero uh, because he made a mistake. He admitted to his mistake. He, you know, he did the manly thing. He did the bishop thing. I made a mistake. I'm going to repent of it. I'm going to let you know how this happened. And I'm very pleased with how he responded to the situation. Something that over the last 2,000 years, so many bishops and clergy and lay people in the same situation have just said, well, it's too late. Well, at Gavin yesterday had a wonderful analogy. Uh, was it Archbishop uh, Cramner, Gavin? I'm not going to steal <laughs> yes. your thunder. Yes. Well, I suggested <clears throat> that um, Julian Henderson's signing the complaint against himself uh, was not entirely unlike uh, Cranmer putting the hand with which he had originally recanted into the fire before it before it um, consumed him. But but without any disrespect to Cranmer and not wanting to compare the writing of a letter to being burnt alive, uh, the point is Christians, we do make mistakes. We do find ourselves getting into positions we wish we hadn't got into. And the critical thing, as always in the spiritual life, is is not the failure. That's always going to happen. It's the repentance and the saying, I'm sorry. Gavin, let me push you uh, on a point. Um, we speak of a, a long laid uh, plan to achieve these ends. Who's doing this? What is the end? I mean, it. Uh, from an American perspective, each each Episcopal <clears throat> election is a local politics. And though we may have a predominantly liberal cast in the House of Bishops, there's no overarching hand guiding anything. It's chaos, uh, for better or for worse. But from what I'm hearing is that something, somebody or something is manipulating and managing this process. Well, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to say, George, but I guess it's probably time to say. I mean, the, the reason I'm a bit hesitant to say is, is because I'm a casualty of the conspiracy. Or, um, so one should, one should be careful in talking about conspiracies. But, but one of the players in all this who has made a huge impact is the Archbishop's Appointment Secretary. Uh, I've known several of them uh, one way or another, but the one who's in place at the moment is called Caroline Boddington. Uh, she used to be in human resources for British gas. Uh, she has a theology degree from Oxford and she brought all the skill sets that British gas human resources provided her with to the Church of England when she was appointed to this position. She is a passionate feminist uh, and she's a skillful operator. And she's drawn around her a group of friends and colleagues and trusted admirers. Uh, and together, they have done their very best to massage the appointment system in the Church of England, which is arcane and complex and uh, works by a series of checks and balances. Um, but it has always been known in the Church of England that if you fell the wrong side of the appointment secretary, um, you would eyebrows might eyebrows would be lifted when they were talking about your name uh small facial signals would be sent from if 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 um if it wasn't a doctor of your file so in this particular case one of the people who's been most instrumental in playing a part in helping develop a progressive culture initially a progressive feminist culture but of course one of the things we've discovered is that feminism uh, although it appears kind and uh, fair and equitable and lovely uh, at the beginning carries with it a whole inner philosophical landscape that leads inevitably to parity for homosexuality uh, to the configuration of reality according to the whatever's going on in the in the imagination which is where transgenderism comes from so i don't want to hold her responsible for all this by any means but she's been there for a very long time she developed a, a whole parallel pool of talented women she trained to be bishops long before the church of england had ever 
pass legislation so they would be in place uh, ready to go as soon as she pulled the trigger. Um, what it means is, that, so it's not, it's not only her fault, but it, it, it dovetails into a, a cultural predisposition that was always weighted in favor of the liberals. What's really terrible and it, and it is the way in which the Anglo-Catholics and the evangelicals have just given way uh, even even now, over the baptismal liturgy, the, the, the Church of England's Evangelical Council and the Anglo-Catholic Society's response have been careful, politic, muted, not wanting to upset, way short of what they really ought to have said. So where where is this mutual flourishing uh, stuff that I hear spouted out from the archbishops time and again? I mean, if I there's a parallel pool of women being prepared... To, uh, point to me where the parallel pool of conservative evangelical or traditional Anglo-Catholics is being prepared. George, I just have to watch my language. I, I, I you know, the words spring to mind <laughs> that, that no Christian gentleman should use in public or private. Mutual flourishing is a chimera. It's a political fix. It is a deceitful uh, mechanism to lull people into a position of, of false security. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's a way of allowing people to get their own private agendas done without too much interference. It, it's, it's, a, it's a shame. Well, it's the biggest lie I've heard uh, in the Church of England uh, until the next lie. Uh, but it's just, it, it continues on where um, it's a good boy network. Everybody's got their job. They're keeping their job. Nobody's getting fired here, but we're restructuring. And oh. mutual flourishing is part of that restructuring. And as long as you don't cause any hay, um, you can stay with the system until you retire out. Um, but, you know, as well, Gavin talked about here. I, 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 want, I want to push uh, this a little further and give a concrete example to my mind of the fraud uh, that is mutual flourishing, which is the St. George's Headstone uh, mm. in the mm. Diocese of London controversy. Uh, Gavin, can you... Uh, I have no idea where Headstone is in London, so you'll have to help me. I think it's in the Williston Episcopal area. That's oh, as far yeah. as I get. I've, I've got something to read to you because it was sent to me by, by the Vicar of St. George's Headstone. Um, the, um, and it, it's too good not to, not to use. If it, let's see if it's on my phone. Um, uh, yes, here, here we are. So um, St. George's Headstone is a, is a traditionalist parish. The Bishop of Wilsdon decided to damn it with faint praise in on Thinking Anglicans today. And this is how he described it. Um, it th th this is dripping with, you know, you decide what it's dripping with. St. George's Headstone, writes the Bishop of Wilsdon, is a suburban parish in the North Holt Archdeacon in the Wilsdon area. Their use of the 1549 liturgy was the choice of the incumbent. It has connections with the prayer book society. I think there's a spit there intended and a liking for the artistic panache of Martin Travers. It was my next door parish when I was an incumbent and area dean, a studied and cultivated suburban eccentricity. You couldn't get more patronizing than that. So it's a, it's a parish in North London. George, what, what, and Kevin and dear gentle listeners, <laughs> what, what they decided to do was they, they, the PCC met and they said, we've got problems with Episcopal oversight, but that's okay because mutual flourishing allows us to make representations to the very broad-minded, generous, touchy-feely, cuddly and inclusive Bishopess of London and ask her for a solution. So they said, we, we like Rod Thomas very much. He's a nice man, but the trouble was he got himself consecrated by people who'd consecrated women. And despite the fact that hundreds of people, including me, wrote to him saying, Rod, don't do this because it will make you inaccessible to some people who need you, he did it because when you accept a job from Welby, it comes with terms and conditions. Uh, so they said, we can't use him. What about the Bishop of Fulham? He's the geographical bishop for London. Well, we have a problem. Geographical with flying bishop. He's yeah, the yeah, flying yeah, bishop. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're missing good, the, the, the good, topic good, is the flying keep bishop. It, <laughs> keep it accurate and clean. Uh, and we have a problem with him because there was a moment when, uh, tragically, his private life fell to pieces. God bless him. Uh, but he was a bishop already, and he had to choose about whether he made himself fully accessible to the Catholic movement by remaining single or whether he got married again. But he decided to get married. He married a divorcee and uh, that meant that he became immediately inaccessible to a large number of faithful 
Catholics who held conservative doctrines on this Was matter. Was there any problem with the fact that he's a Freemason? Uh. Well, funny you should mention that, George, because <laughs> he's a Freemason. <laughs> and people who, of, of, who know anything about these things, this is not only theologically, politically, and sociologically unacceptable, but it's spiritually ghastly. So the the Freemason, and also he was he 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 said he gave his Freemasonry up when he accepted office, and then there's all kinds of indications that he was being less than truthful about keeping not on. entirely straightforward. I think not is the phrase. Straight. It was a lovely lovely phrase used in one of our political moments called "economic with the actualité." I, I think this is the lying word that Kevin was using earlier on. Well, so for these two reasons, he's also. Um, a problem for the PCC. They just want an Orthodox bishop, please. Is well, it possible? they have an Orthodox bishop? I mean, how is this a new problem? Well, the, so the, the, the Bishopess of London for them is not a bishop at all, but she's a legal officer, of course. Uh, Rod, Rod, Rod Thomas, there are sacramental issues about with him. Uh, and, the, and, and the Bishop of Fulham is problematic for the reasons we've explained. So they just said, well, we do have Orthodox bishops. They they very much like one of the other flying bishops in the society, uh, an excellent man called Jonathan Goodall, who's Bishop of Epstein. Really, actually, in terms of character, intelligence, spirituality, and integrity, head and shoulders above m most of his colleagues in the Church of England. He's a great guy. And they say, can we have him, please? And the inclusive, kind, gentle, fuzzy, mutual, flourishing Bishopess of London said, over my dead body. So they said, well, that's not fair. Um, we thought we could trust you for mutual flourishing. But this is good. That's good news, because when someone doesn't quite live up to their ethical expectations, we have someone called an independent advisor we can go to. His name is Sir Philip Moore. He's an arbitrator. We'll write to him. So they wrote to him. And Sir Philip thought of it very carefully. And then something happened that has happened before in the Church of England. There must have been at least two dozen uh, clergy disciplinary measures brought against bishops in the Church of England for really serious misbehavior. They were designed to be applied to bishops as much as to clergy. Not a single one of these clergy disciplinary measure accusations ever stuck to a single bishop. I, I, I have to interrupt you, Gavin. That's not true. Uh -oh. George, put me right. George Bell. <laughs> George Bell. Oh, George Bell. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuck if like you're glue. A dead Super glue. Hero of the Church of England, you can be. Yeah, you, you can, can be. be you could be. Uh, but hey, overlook the abuse, uh, abuse of children. But shuffle it, clergy around. Uh, mm -hmm. Have your files disappear in the flood in the Archbishop's Palace in York. But if uh, you're alive. No if you're a live Episcopal malefactor, nothing will touch you. Well, in the spirit of this, uh, Sir Philip Moore uh, looked at the PCC's complaint, and they say, and and his eyes raised, and and he said in his report, which is in the Church Times, he said, uh, when these arrangements were put into place for mutual flourishing, it it wasn't expected that that it would encompass any eccentric range of any theological view that any PCCs thought they wanted to offer? Of course not. No. <laughs> so it's a charade, George and Kevin. I mean, it, and it's really sad because, you know, there are things we're supposed to do, you know, in the, to be church. They're difficult. We, 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 we try and love God. We forgive our enemies. We try not to badmouth each other, though we can hold each other to account. But we should tell the truth. <laughs> it should be transparent. But, but I want to take this all the way back up to Julian Henderson because let the way I have witnessed the Church of England operate from my perch observing from the outside in, what they've done with Jonathan Baker, the Bishop of Fulham, is what they attempted to do with Julian Baker. The Bishop of Fulham and you have the Society, the Society of St. Will, Will, Wilfred and Hilda Swish, which... I don't think was a, a well, it may have been well thought out uh, ac acronym for the uh, uh, touchy feely Anglo Catholics. Well, basically, what you do is to you appoint a weak or failed or flawed or corrupt person to represent the opposition. And then you basically can squeeze the opposition to death. Jonathan Baker, as the flying bishop of Fulham, is losing parishes because people say, look, this man is divorced, remarried, he's a Freemason. We're not too certain about this guy, and he's the one that's to be our champion. Now, basically, miss... what they set out to do with Julian Henderson was the same thing to neuter him. 
How did institutionally he miss- neuter him, and Henderson mm-hmm. has fought back. How did he miss being appointed to this transgender baptism thing? You know, well, just, Baker was on the Pilling Commission. Yeah, he, he was on well, Pilling. He's yeah, the, no. He was an Anglo-Catholic flying bishop on the Pilling Commission about mm-hmm. homosexuality, and he voted on the pro-gay right, side. Yeah. Well, well, one of the, I mean, we didn't, I didn't manage to say that amongst all the facts and figures I put together. That's why there are three of us. <laughs> But he caught, that's why the three of us. He caused the most enormous offence, and, and actually, it's worse than that. There's um, the, there is a, a very nice and splendid bishop of because this is so. Um, who's the bishop who did not sign the billing report? Sinclair, the bishop, uh, Keith, Keith Sinclair. Sinclair. Yeah, Sinclair. Keith Sinclair, Birkenhead. Bishop, bishop Bir- Birkenhead. Now Keith is a great guy, a fine, upstanding man. But you know, the world and the church weigh heavy upon his shoulders at the moment, because. He he was supposed to give way, <laughs> and he 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 didn't give way in signing the Pilling Report, which was a passport to progressive sexuality. And Baker was supposed to stand with him on behalf of the Anglo Catholics, and Baker folded, uh, the, but putting Keith Sinclair in a far more isolated and lonely position. And 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 you know that was an ir- that was a reprehensible thing to do. See, for, for our American audience, you people wonder, why hasn't a Bob Duncan, if you will, arisen within the Church of England? Why, in other words, we can point to a whole crop, not hundreds, but we can point to bishops, and even to this day, uh, sitting Episcopal bishops of a conservative bent who haven't knuckled under. Bill Love uh, has been in the press recently. Well, it's because we have... In the United States, we still have a degree of local autonomy mm-hmm. that is not possible in the Church of England. So no, someone like that. Bill Love or Bob Duncan would never rise to the position of bishop. No, the people, the people we needed who might have saved the Church of England uh, and, and and brought some integrity to it have been weeded out long ago. Um, and and I'm, I'm you know this. Let's not pretend I'm talking about myself. I'm not at all. I, I plenty of, of of personal flaws that um, would get between me and the wider responsibility. But I know I know some very good people indeed, who have been uh, victims of this progressive sieving out of talent. And what it's done is it's left us, it's left us with a whole bunch of of kind of, uh, not kind of. It has left us with being managed by semi competent grey in personality, third-rate incompetence, middle managers, who are all company men and women. And one of the great things about the Church of England was we used to have characters like Michael Ramsey. Now, Michael Ramsey was not the sanest tool in the in the drawer, <laughs> but but he but he had holiness because holiness and sanity don't often go perfectly together. Nor do prophecy and and and, and well balancedness, but. All, all, all these kind of charisms that the Church of England has in the past managed to hold together to its great advantage have been filtered and weeded out for political purposes. And what we have now are a group of men and women who are playing church. Yeah. Uh, for instance, the the society of uh, the Swish Society put out their statement this morning on the uh, transgender liturgy, and essentially they said, "We applaud the Church of England for its pastoral outreach to the transgender." but we have some concerns that this may compel some of our members to act against their conscience. So essentially what they're saying is, so long as we're left alone to dress up, play church, and hang out with each other, the rest of you can go to hell. Um, this is not a church. This is, this is, a, this is a club. Uh, my, 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 my daughter was writing to me this morning about some, some philosophical and emotional things, and uh, we were comparing the difference between trusting people in politics and trusting people in the church. And we, one of the things we, we ended up by saying was that you know, the church has a reasonable hope of, of, of re- acting on Christ's resources until it behaves politically, until it becomes a political system. And then the moment power and vested interest take precedence, well, the Holy Spirit flies out of the window. But you need the Holy Spirit to, to mend broken people and mend broken relationships and get people to tell the truth. And unfortunately, the Church of England at the moment doesn't show many signs of having much of the Holy Spirit. No, it does not. Gentlemen, we've hit our 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, three apiece, 10 apiece. Yeah, 30 minutes were up in Adam. But it occurred to me that, you know, we have a not a younger audience, but there's many in our audience who do not know what a flying bishop is or how the Church of England got flying bishops. 
and it goes right back to mutual flourishing. Uh, any volunteers to explain it? Well, if I may say, I think it was in uh, 93, Gavin, am I correct? Mm -hmm. uh, when, yeah. they, when they began ordain, ordaining women to the priesthood, uh, a compromise was reached so that uh, there would be bishops in the province of York and the province of Canterbury who would have Ebbsfleet, Richborough, and then also in the Diocese of London and Fulham, who would be bishops who were not part of this system, who could continue uh, the uh, transmission of holy orders uh, undiluted, if you will. Is that a fair analysis, Kevin? That's yes, a fair, fair exactly right. My and, point is, why can't the other side have the flying bishop? You know, it's, it's always the Orthodox who have to compromise and have the flying bishop. Uh, it's crazy. Well, because the only reason why they had, uh, I've been tough on the Anglo-Catholics in this episode. Well, in 1993, it was the evangelicals who folded mm -hmm. and walked away. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, there are very few heroes here. Yeah. Um, the, in other words, it's, you know, I, I can uh, carp about uh, Anglo-Catholics in the UK, of which I'm not one, nor ever will be, not being to my taste. Well, so what? But if you will, my own team, my own team is the one that caused this problem in 1993. Uh, so please don't hear me to say that there's any one, one failed or flawed group. We're all screwed up. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> No one is without sin in this. Okay, gentlemen, we've hit the end of our show. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 465 on December the 18th in the third week of Advent. 